Okay, so a couple things here really quick. First off, the Russian steamroller. Secondly, it's going to be in the 50s. We'll see. I don't want to get my hopes up, but. And so, you know, in a couple weeks, we'll be back. Everyone who's not DOI will all be back in here. There are 29 students signed up for this period. Uh, my guess is we're about 22 or 23. And you know, work spread the desk out as much as possible, but we'll be in here. That's why all the windows will be open. We got the two air purifiers, so we're actually in very good shape. Air moves in here. I there's our few rooms across the hallway. They don't have windows. Go back. I'm over. Moving on. No, I check. I can't believe we don't have windows for them. It's awful. But we'll do that. You have to start thinking about your AP exam. I mentioned that yesterday, but start thinking about whether or not you want to do it online or type, I mean. So if you type on the keyboard or written, there are advantages to both. Handwritten, of course, your hand gets tired because you have a lot of writing to do. But then again, when you write by hand, it's harder to miss stuff. You, know, you remember things better. It's a lot easier to get things when you type. It just is. It's just for everybody. But there are advantages to both. And so if you, everybody has to do 55 multiple choice and a DBQ. If you handwrite, you have to do three of those short answer questions. Remember short answer questions, each of them are three, three sentence short IDs, remember that. And then one long essay, another five paragraph essay. If you type it online, you have to do six short answer questions. No long answer, just six of them. And I can see advantages to writing the essay. I can see the advantages to writing six short answer questions. Uh, I think the short answer question might be a little bit easier than the essay, but if you know, but in the essay question, you get choices. And if you know it, that'll be easier. So we have to start thinking about it. Yeah. It, it, as I understand it, there's a chance it might be online, but uh, even if you're doing it on the computer, you have. I think I'm going to try to get the paragraphs and then spread everybody out. I mean, even if you're going to have a But don't quote me on that. The counts are sometimes kind of set that up. And, and uh, I don't have a trouble for But as soon as I find out, I'll let you know. So start thinking. And I signed that map yesterday. Did everyone get the packet? I will assign that espionage act over the next couple of day, days. That's the last page. And that's a law. Technically, it's still on the books, and it is an absolutely amazing law. It shows what war does. And so let's go ahead then and do this thing. Get, do, the, do the war that will change everything and how this thing started. I'm always, I'm not going to lie, fascinated how wars began. So let's, I got to backtrack just a little bit. Lots of stuff happened here. So we got through... Didn't we get right to there? There. Okay, so so we got industrialization. Who's the monarch? Who's the emperor of Germany? Kaiser Wilhelm II. And what was his disability that led him to be shockingly insecure and make rash, horrible decisions? Yeah, left withered left arm. Who was the monk? Who claimed he could help Alexis, Tsar Nicholas II's Rasputin. Yeah, Rasputin. And it showed this these decrepit monarchies, both men made rash, insane decisions, and both will be in a way directly responsible for this. And then we had, oh, nationalism. Um, what am I missing? Oh, imperialism. And don't forget Slavic nationalism. What was German the name for the for the German belief that they, they had a superior a civilization. What was that called? Yeah, that was culture. And what was the race they made up for Germans? And did I tell you what the, the actual Aryans, who they are? Oh, I, did, I forgot. I must have meant to. I meant to. Does that make you feel better? So Aryans, this is actually the name for an ethnic group that lives in this area right here. And then they swept in through here. And there's a country of the Aryans. And that country is called Iran. And because of where they live in the world, they don't necessarily look like people who grew up in northern Norway. But 
They're the actual Aryans. So the whole German nationalist Aryan thing was made up. And don't forget, Nazi Germany just piggybacked on that idea. They did not invent it. This was part of this German mythology. So we got the arms race. Do we talk about mass armies, artillery? So we got to do this, Germans, French. Uh, so script, conscriptions like the draft. Okay, so we got through that, and I believe we got through the bear then, right? And when you fight a bear, what do you have to do? Keep the ride up. Keep the ride up. Bears always lead with the left. Uh, huh? Yeah. Uh, but here's the thing about them is bears kind of, they get both, but they jab with the left. By the way, the poor bear. I got to tell you, I'm not, okay, I'm not necessarily cheering for the, uh, for the bear to maul them, but I like the, the bear to maul the handle to put that horrible muzzle on the bear. So, the symbol of the arms race, though, the super weapon of this era and one we have to talk about is a super battleship that would be dubbed the Dreadnought. So the Dreadnought right here, that would be this first, made by the British, this uh, it had a coal fire turbine so it could move fast, steel armor. It had 10 11 inch guns that could fire almost 18 miles accurately, so over the horizon, just about. That's why they had this big thing so they could try to get as high as they can to aim it. This revolutionized naval warfare and made every other navy in the world, including that great white fleet which the US sent around the world made them all obsolete. This became the super weapon of the era. And this dreadnought right here weighed nearly 20,000 tons. And it would only be just a few years later that they would make bigger dreadnoughts that would be twice as big. And eventually, this is a super dreadnought, the Queen Elizabeth. And that thing would be uh, nearly 40,000 tons. So that'd be fun to take on Canyon Fair. I'm just a little hint. Be kind of fun to have a 20,000 ton ship. I don't need a big. Every other ship in every other navy was obsolete. And these are incredibly expensive. And Germany, I'm sorry, Britain is going to make eventually almost 40 of them, 38 actually, right before the war began, and they will continue to make them. But when the war began, they, they slowed down. And one of the most fierce weapons, if necessary, they could fire a cat over 20 miles. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to mess with a cat that's been fired by a cat. By the way, there's a lot of pictures of like this. All the ships had little mascots and they had cats. And cats, they always went, whenever the cat would climb to the gun, they got, they got a camera, got a picture of it. They rarely fired the cat. That's necessary, right? We all understand mice are a problem. But the British started building them. Only the wealthiest and most industrially advanced countries began to build them. And this really showed how industrialization and wealth began to divide the haves and have nots. Here's an American dreadnought, that's the New York. And the US started building them. France had to spend every penny they had on their land army. Their population was only two thirds the size of Germany. They felt very vulnerable. Russia didn't have the industrial growth. Italy made a couple, but they were just beginning industrialization. Austria uh, made a couple. Japan made some. Well, Britain made four first and then Japan. But the biggie about the dreadnoughts is this. The Kaiser wanted a navy. And so he began to aggressively build dreadnoughts. Germany. Here are German dreadnoughts. And something new. You'll notice a plane, a float plane. And when Germany began to build that, that directly threatened Britain. And that pushed Britain into what's the alliance that had France and Russia, and then Britain would join as kind of an understanding. What was that? Yeah, the Triple Entente. And then the other alliance, what was that? Germany, Austria, and then Italy kind of on the periphery. That's Triple Alliance. That pushed Britain towards France and Russia. A foolish move. Actually, Germany and Britain, Britain were actually talking about um, having an alliance between those two. And within 10 years, the Kaiser wanted to say, oh, I have a navy too. That threatened, that threatened Britain. Britain has a tiny army, tiny. Bam. 
What country did Britain say they would defend if attacked? Look how close Belgium is. And if Germany has a fleet that could threaten Britain, just jump over the channel. Could they ever allow that? This was a foolish move. And these ships were so expensive that everybody was afraid to use them. Because you would lose so much treasure and so much prestige. And so Germany would have nearly 20 dreadnoughts. And most of the war, they just sat in harbor right here. Just sat there. And Britain's dreadnoughts sat here waiting for them. There's only one major battle of dreadnoughts. You right here called the Battle of Jaffa. It's a huge battle. This is the Jaffa. Uh, Basically, draw a strategic British victory. But it shows one of the follies of the arms race. If you spend so much money and treasure on something, you might be afraid to actually use it. And the United States has weapons like that right now. I'm not, and I'm not even talking about nuclear weapons. I'm talking about weapons, especially planes. They're so expensive that we won't use them. The best example would be the B-2 stealth bomber. It's so expensive. So hard to fly and so vulnerable if it's ever seen that we won't use it. And thus we know it can't be hit. And we're making a plane right now called the F-35, which literally last week the Air Force admitted is not only a piece of junk, but it's too expensive to use. It's too expensive to use in the role that it was made for. And uh, a lot of people suspected this. Don't worry, it's only about, it's a, you know, between 200 and 300 million dollars. That's pocket change. Yeah. And we we pledged to build a thousand of them. And my guess is they'll still build them because there's money to be made. And the Air Force has admitted they won't work. They're too expensive. So with that, but let's be honest, and what's the real army? Or what's the real issue? Land armies, artillery, mass amounts of men. And what a word, a word we have to get is a word that's going to have greater meaning as the war goes on, but it's mobilization. And what mobilization meant is this. Okay, this map, it shows the various numbers of men when the war began. The, the date that people consider World War War began and the world changed forever, August 4th. And it says Germany had approximately 4.5 million. By the way, look how many France had. 4 million with two-thirds the population. So France is going to risk everything. Russia could have more, but they still had six million men. Okay, good hunk didn't have rifles. That's problematic in the war. And those with rifles had five bullets apiece. Russia had some problems. And Britain did not even have near this many. That's a big exaggeration. Britain did not have a standing army. They didn't have a draft. But here's the thing. That's not how he meant they had in uniform normally. Normally, they have, remember I told you yesterday, or I think I told you about every young man at 19 is drafted, right? Did I tell you that? So every young man is drafted at 19, and they're in what they call the standing army. So in the standing army, Germany had about 450,000. So two weeks before the war began, they had 450,000, which is a huge army. That's a massive army. How they get the 4 million? They called out the reserves. And calling out the reserves... That's mobilization. Yeah, call out the reserves. And that's a big deal. Because if you call out mobilization, we're mobilizing our forces. What that means, they post this in towns, they train for this. They're going to go to every town and say, all men. So basically, everybody from 20 to 40, you go. And this has got to be prepared and planned. they got to get on board trains, go to the frontier, etc. And if you mobilize, what's your enemy going to do? They have no choice, don't they? Because if France mobilizes and Germany doesn't, they only have 450,000 men and France will have 4 million. They have to mobilize. And then here's the thing then. If we call it mobilization, your enemy is going to mobilize. And even if you mobilize, who has the advantage? Which country? Generically, which country? who mobilize first can attack first while your enemies are not prepared. So if Germany can mobilize first, they can attack France before France is ready. And so everybody began to plan and organize to take over the entire country to mobilize. 
if there's mobilization, they take over the entire rail network. They take over the bridges, take over the roads, they take over all public transportation, they take over private transportation, they take over the country to get troops from Helena to the border of Canada. So we can finally take care of the threat from Saskatchewan. Who's with me? But your enemies doing the same thing. The smartest young men in Germany, in fact, they started testing. This was young men now, and then later on, it's going to be young men and women. They still kind of do this. When they get to their equivalent of eighth grade, they have a big battery of tests they have to take. And that will kind of pigeonhole them on what path of life they're going to pick, going to go into. They're not quite as strict as they used to be, but it's a pretty scary test. You just imagine your eighth grade take a test that will affect the rest of your life. It's not quite like that now, but that test still exists. And my nephew who lives in Berlin is an eighth grader. He's equivalent to an eighth grader. So he's getting a little nervous. And this is such a weird year that I'm pushing back. But still, they would take the smartest young man in Germany starting in the 1890s. Not smart, the best at that. And they would recruit them in the army, recruit them in the officer corps, not necessarily to become leaders of men in the front, but to learn train timetables so they could take over the entire rail network to get troops from their homes to the front fastest. So here's it about mobilization. And this part, get this down. It's the entire takeover of the country by the military. It's the entire takeover. Because you have to beat your enemy. So you got to take over every part of the economy. That means you got to take over factories, don't you? You have to take over food production. You got to take over everything. Because if you don't and your enemy does, you're vulnerable. Now, this was all planned and planned and planned for years. And if Germany starts doing it, what does France have to do? And so on. But Germany will be the best. They know it. And so, politicians never understood what this meant in the moment. They never understood that when they say, okay, when they threaten somebody with mobilization for a political aim, some kind of diplomatic aim, they don't understand that the generals have been planning and if they mobilize, they're attacking. Because if they don't, their enemies will. They never understood this. It's important to understand that Europe was on a hair trigger. Now you might say, God, that sounds pretty dangerous in 1914. What do you think the United States is on right now? Those Minuteman three missiles around Great Falls, 100 of them, can all be fired in five minutes. And if they were fully armed, that would be enough to destroy the world. Just those ones around Great Falls. There's more. There's ones around Minot, there's ones around Cheyenne, and there's also submarine launch ballistic missiles. Oh, we got fleet more world many times. And not near as many times as when I was your age. When I, when I was your age, it was much more scary. Much more scary. I'm thankful that I did not know how scary it was. We came within minutes of 1983 at full-scale nuclear war. You wouldn't have to worry about the AP exam. But, huh? Well, let's not bog ourselves down. Yeah, it's actually, I would find out, we would find out later how close things were in 1983. It was, 1983, it was so close. Wow. But, anyways. We're on a hair trigger now. And if we're on a hair trigger, who else is on a hair trigger? Everybody else with nuclear weapons can fire within five minutes. So that means Russia, China, North Korea, India, Pakistan, Israel, Britain, France. South Africa gave their spot. I wouldn't be surprised if South Africa went somewhere. Oh, and Iran is going to have one. Unless we get back in that nuclear deal very soon. So, it's kind of scary. Back to this. So they're all planning. So even though Germany has a massive army, you notice they're, they're um, less than half the size of the combined Russia and French army. And they know Austria pretty weak. Even though it has three million men, it's, they don't trust them. And they'd be right. The Austrian army did not perform well. If Germany tries to split their army and defend both, and they'll be caught, they'll be squashed. In a long war, they'll be squashed, they'll be outnumbered. So Germany going into the 20th century is looking at this and they, they're deciding, 
If we have war and mobilize, how do we win? Well, they decided we have to knock out the first threat, the country that will mobilize the quickest, our enemy that will mobilize quickest. We have to attack them first and then attack our enemy, our other enemy. Who will mobilize first? Here are their enemies. Yeah. Yeah, France, by far more industrialized, better rail network. France will mobilize first. So Germany's plan going into the 20th century was, if we mobilize, we got to knock France out. How do we do that? We attack her first, defeat their army, then load our army up on trains and beat Russia. Because we expect Russia won't mobilize for a month. So we'll have, they gave themselves six weeks to knock France out. And France is a powerful country with a great army. So this is a daunting task. How do they do it? Well, the French army's all gonna be here. They'll get bogged down, take too long, here come the Russian hordes. They can't attack through here, why? What country is this? Uh, Switzerland. Mountains. They'll get bogged down in the mountains. That's how the Switzerland can maintain the neutrality because they're mountains. Belgium was also neutral, but it's flat, so Germany didn't care. So that's what they decided. What if we mass our army attack through Belgium? And this became known as, as a plan after the head of the great German general staff, the Schlieffland plan. So von Schlieffland was the head of the great German staff in the first decade of the 20th century, and he spent his whole life working on this plan. The Schlieffland plan. And the plan was, here's the mass of the French army. We'll put 90% of our army in a big right hook, sweep through Belgium. Okay, if Belgium won't surrender immediately, we'll destroy. We'll destroy Belgium. And sweep around Paris and defeat the mass French army right here. It is a really risky plan. Because if the French attack here, they're going to let them in. And they're hoping that the Russians take more in a month. Because they're going to put almost nothing here to stop the Russians. It's all or nothing, knock out the French. And this is actually a desperate plan. It's a shockingly desperate plan. And the French plan, cleverly known as Plan 17, would be to attack in those lost provinces. So actually, the French plan uh, played right into the German plan. They'll attack into this rugged, mountainous area here. They'll get bogged down, and the French and the Germans will sweep around. But von Schlieffen by 1909 realized one very important thing about the Schlieffen plan, the plan that's named after him. Anybody want to guess the problem with the plan? It won't work. It can't work. There's no way it'll work. If they try to send 3 million men through here, It'll be nothing but a big traffic jam. There's not enough roads, they won't be able to supply it. And then, even if they could somehow win this victory, the men would be so exhausted. How can you expect them then to go fight on the massive Russian army? The plan won't work. So when he resigned and then died before the war began, he pretty much made, you know, he, he knew the war plan wouldn't work. But guess what? That's their plan. That's their plan. So if there's war. Germany mobilizes and attacks whom? So that is the key element of this. They had a plan and they didn't know what else to do. And so with that, it's going to be in the Balkans, a crisis in the Balkans, the Balkans where Slavic nationalism is. They call it the Balkans powder keg, which I think is a very clever name. But remember, Serbia was riling up Slavic nationalism in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Here's a clever cartoon of the Balkan Troubles, and this is actually from the 1880s. They knew the Balkans would be troublesome then. Some damn fool thing in the Balkans, they used to say. There were two Balkan wars in 1911 and 1913. Two of them. And then somehow they didn't blow up in the, um, into Armageddon. They won't be able to survive the third one. So let's get to what happened. So remember, Serbia wants to trigger some kind of revolt of the Slavs here. 
and the Serbian secret police heard that the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was coming to a place called Syria. I'll, I'll give you Syria in a second. And they came up with an idea. Thus we have the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austrian throne. His uncle was the Kaiser of Austria. He'd been on the throne since 1848. So he'd been there forever. Here's our suit, Franz Ferdinand. So the New York's coming down to go to uh, watch military um, maneuvers, uh, training in Bosnia. And then he was going to do kind of a grand tour of Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia. And so there was a secret group of Slavic nationals. Slavic nationals. Called the Black Hand. And the Black Hand, basically, there's a lot of Black Hands in history. There was a organized crime um, in the US in 1900 called the Black Hand. But they do an attack, they leave a handprint, kind of scary looking handprint. So that was their call calling card. They're Slavic nationals. They want to basically have a revolt in this area of Austria. So you assassinate the Archduke, Austria will go nuts, punish Slavs, they'll revolt. So they want Slavs to be punished. So the C this, but this this group, even though they claim to be in Austria, Austria are actually funded, equipped, and led by the Serbian secret police, who supplied them with weapons. Uh, kind of very crude hand grenades and convince them to assassinate our suit Franz Ferdinand. One of them, here he is, and here he is with a member of the, of the Serbian secret police, was Gabriela Princi. And Princi was like all of these assassins. Young, idealistic, but also quite ill. He had tuberculosis. He was already gone. The, the Serbian secret police would give all seven assassins a little glass vial of cyanide with a cork in it. And they were supposed to bite that glass vial if they're caught and kill themselves. And the assumption was these idealistic young men who are, already have a death sentence, most of them have consumption, tuberculosis, they'd be willing to, to die. So Serbia could say, hey, we had nothing to do with it. Do it. Even though it's a pretty slipshod organization. They had documents from Serbia. They had Serbian weapons. I mean, everyone knew it was going to be Serbia. So there's Prince Sip right here. That's after he was captured by the Austrians. So Sarajevo, the plan was for the small motorcade of the Archduke, and he's riding with his wife, would drive through Sarajevo. There'd be a kind of a procession. People would come out um, almost like a parade. They'd go to the courthouse and then drive back through town. So basically through town, out of town. Six assassins and one person who was like coordinating it were waiting along the road within the crowd. And this is like a knee high little river here. So you just, you can afford it, just walk across. These are the assassins. The first assassin lost his nerve. And by the way, you notice the name, Bosnia, because that used to be controlled by the Turks has a large uh, Christian and a large uh, Muslim population. But he lost his nerve. The second one threw one of those grenades. The driver saw that it was smoky as it went through the air, hit the gas, it bounced off the back of the car, exploded underneath the car behind it, wounding two officers. Once that happened, everybody panicked and they drove quickly past the other assassins who all began to run away. Some began to try to cross the river, which is, <laughs> is not suspicious at all. Those who were captured tried to bite their glass cyanide and it kind of um, dissipated because the cork wasn't sealed right and they just got really sick. So they were all captured. Princey, who was right here, Princey crossed over here and went to a delicatessen and got a sandwich. <laughs> he was hungry all of a sudden. He tried to do something natural, kind of blend in. So the Archduke went here, yelled at the mayor of Sarajevo, and then decided, I want to visit the wounded officers in the hospital. So they changed the route. 
They're just going to get the heck out of this area. But still drive where the assassins were, but they assumed they'd all scattered. But the driver leading the procession got confused. And they were going back. They turned on the old route. They slammed on the brakes when they realized their mistakes just in front of the very delicatessen where Prince Seek was literally at that moment walking out. And he walked out like, oh, there they are. Pull out a pistol and fire. Literally like that. Murdering both Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. Now, I know you want to see a very elaborate cartoon version. So here's the bomb. So you know that's Archduke because he has a mustache. Then they drive back. Oh, no. Bang. Yeah, that's the kind of graphics. That, that pretty much tells the story right there. I could have just shown you that. There had been anarchist assassinations all over. Franz Joseph, the Kaiser of Austria, his wife had been murdered by an anarchist. But there was no war. This one would trigger the war. A whole series of events around it. Who knows what would have happened if they wouldn't have made that wrong turn. They would not have been assassinated. So there would not have been a war there. But it, there are so many things happen. It's hard to imagine there's not a war. There's a painting of this. This is just minutes after he was arrested. He would actually die of tuberculosis while in prison in 1918. Prince Equal. He was too young to execute. 21 was the, the minimum age for execution in Austria. So they were holding him for a big show trial after Austria won the war, which did not happen, obviously. And everybody was furious. They found documents and weapons from Serbia. Well, the first thing that's going to happen are reprisals. Austria did exactly what the Serbians thought. They murdered thousands of Slavic nationals. Anybody they suspected or just they rounded, round up men in villages that were Slavs and murdered them. These are pictures of the gallows. This is a weird ratchet execution system they would set up where they would slowly strangulate people. This horrific method of assassination. So they killed all these people and who had nothing to do with the assassination, but everybody blamed Serbia. And for two weeks, the assumption was there's going to be war. Even Serbia's friends, what country saw themselves as the protector of the Slavs and therefore Serbia? Russia was even mad at Serbia. And France who didn't like Serbia, but they're kind of stuck with it because of Russia. They were mad. Everybody would have expected Austria to do something as a reprisal, some kind of an attack on Serbia. But Austria didn't do anything for two weeks. And people thought the war might not happen. We might have survived. The crisis averted. Little did they know, during the month of July, and what we'll call today a July crisis, behind the scenes, especially in Vienna and Berlin, talks were of war. And it went like this. First off, Austria, they wanted to not just have a, not just a, uh, a reprisal. They wanted to punish Serbia. They wanted full-scale war. They wanted to knock Serbia out. They wanted to knock them out. But they knew if they attacked Serbia, they of Russia. They were worried Russia might not allow a full-scale invasion of Serbia. So they needed Germany. So Austria went to Germany. And the Kaiser would give a blanket guarantee we call today the blank check. Basically, the Kaiser said, do whatever you want. We have your back if Russia attacks. Now, Germany never really expected Austria to go to a full-scale attack. And the Kaiser was not thinking back. Everybody's about ready to go on vacation. The Kaiser always went sailing in Ju July up the fjords of Norway. So he left. Most of the leaders of the German government actually went on their vacation. So they didn't think a big deal. Austria, though, is planning a full-scale attack on Serbia. We can knock them out, humiliate them, push off our crisis further. But the commanding general of the German army, von Mulkey, whose uncle's like the greatest hero of the German army, history, there he is, he has decided, let's have the Armageddon now. Let's have war now. And he pushed Austria to attack full scale. He wanted 
Russia to attack. Von Moltke figured there's going to be war anyways. Every day we wait, our enemies get stronger. Let's go. So Von Moltke decided full out war. We're going. He didn't tell anybody. He just did it. But the Austrians assumed Germany wants this. And also, everybody is kind of living in this delusional world that Russia won't do anything. They thought the Tsar was too weak. So, at the end of the month, nearly a month after the assassination, out of the blue, Austria sent a 10-part ultimatum to Serbia. And here they call it the uh, a note, the brutal tenor of the note. They sent it on a Friday afternoon and said, you have two days. And if you don't agree to all 10, we go to war. And this ultimatum, these 10 parts, each part was specifically designed to be so onerous that Serbia would never agree. Basically, Serbia would have to turn over their country to Austria. And they knew Serbia would never do it. Austria wanted them to turn it down. They want war. And this literally just blew everything up. It was Friday afternoon on June 27th. You got to be kidding me. It was such a shock to the world. But Serbia kind of agreed to nine of them. They had little qualifications. Russia's begging them to agree. And they kind of agree, but kind of agreeing to nine is not totally agreeing to 10. And so what did Austria do? Austria declares war. Who immediately says you can't attack Serbia? or we'll go to war. Austria ignores that. And so what does Russia do? To threaten Austria, the Tsar orders a mobilization. They mobilize. And then who immediately says, we've got to mobilize now? That's exactly what von Moltke wanted. The Kaiser who hurried back from his voyage was told we have no choice. Germany mobilizes. And literally like that, the entire world's at war. Because if Germany mobilizes, what do they do? In fact, let me sum it up for you. Remember the Shield of Plan? Because once they go to war. So, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is assassinated by Slavic nationalists. So naturally, Germany attacks France. Does it make perfect sense now? Do you get how insane this is? This is absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. And to attack France, they go through Belgium. You go through Belgium, who does that get into the war? The only country that had no choice in this whole affair was France, of the major powers. Only France. They're stuck. So. Here's a clever cartoon, Serbia, then Austria, Russia, Germany, and I like France and Britain all joining in. This is an easy follow chart of that if you missed some things. Okay, I just thought this was funny. Here's a newspaper headline. It's the onion, so it's satire, but it's actually not far from the truth, is it? Uh, Ottoman Empire almost declared war on itself. People struggle to remember enemies. My fa- I like the map. But my favorite, assassination of Archduke spreads fear at Archduke Convention. There's no Archduke Convention. But look at a real headline. It's pretty close to the truth. Same, isn't it? Overnight, like a shockwave, and nobody will come out of this ahead. This is the... Uh, the Russian scene. Well, there's a British version of one of those cartoons involving some kind of animals. I don't know what Italy is. Here's a British dog, a poodle. Okay, August 4th, 1914 is considered the beginning of the war. Why is that the beginning of the war? So Germany mobilizes. They tell Belgium, we're coming unless you surrender. Belgium is going to fight. But if Germany goes through Belgium, it's August 4th that Britain will declare war. Britain didn't have to go to war, but they felt they had no choice. But this is all a war of choice. And once they enter it, it's worldwide. And it's going to be almost impossible for Germany to win. 
uh, but they almost do. And there's mass hysteria. People are overjoyed. But this is why they call it soon to be dubbed the Great War. But while the war is going on, they start calling it world, the World War. The World War. The World War. And then something else will happen beginning in 1939. And almost immediately, they started calling that war in 1939 World War II. So this became World War I. And one of the saddest names for this, nobody could imagine people would be so crazy to do this again. So they started calling this after the war, the war to end all wars, which is depressing. Oh. That's weird, isn't it? We don't have time to write a thesis, do we? We're doing it tomorrow, beginning of class. So, how about we get in see it? But do you see that? The same year that's British, or that's, uh, those are British Tommies jumping into the water, practicing their new life vests. So, I'll say tomorrow we'll finish it, but everyone thought, everybody thought they were on the side of, of the angels. Everybody. So we'll finish right at that, and don't forget the maps. I will sign the Espionage Act. Everyone has a copy of the pack, right? The videos we'll watch. We might start the Killing Fields, which is a very appropriate name for this great documentary I've been working on. We'll watch that probably starting on Thursday and watch it on Friday. We'll do it in class, so I'll show it online. Because I have to stop and add stuff, which is what I do all the time. Yes? I'm going to make it probably on Monday. I'm, I think I'm just going to decide tomorrow. So I'm going to do next Monday. The map's due on Friday. How many people have looked at the maps and can do most of it without looking? You know the geography of Europe? Maybe. Maybe? Well, you know Spanish now. It's cheese. Yeah. So you went to Kansas State, huh? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> With the beautiful Manhattan, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Lots of wheat. Yes. How much I want to talk about Did we get it right to here? Is this one right? I'll put it in a different picture. That was my fourth year. Huh? We got to the concert. We got to the concert? Oh, shoot. This is my fourth favorite concert of all time. What's your third Paul McCartney in the Zoom. This game, you guys Paul McCartney in the yeah, he played at the, at the uh, Washington Bridge Stadium. I got it. The biggest concert ever in my family. I'm sorry, no, I was not supposed to. I don't know. Tyler, 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 Military! We got to alliances! Let's go, people of Burning Daylight! I'm tired of Burning Daylight! You got to get that. No, I knew one of you did. No, I told you. 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 I told